This is a true story about an ex-friend of mine I tried to help through his terrifying obsession with a girl, to no avail. I've always been the type to observe everything from a safe distance. Seldom am I ever brought into drama, but people come to me for advice a lot. I've given my best and most sound counseling to friends, but this particular guy I knew was beyond any form of help. The guy, we'll call him Andy, I'll change all the names, made no point to cover up his psycho. From mumbling out loud to himself in public to being physically harmful, Andy was quite the basket case. I started out knowing very little about him because I kept to myself in come gym class. When we'd walk the track, I'd have my headphones in most of the time. When a girl began walking around the track with him and conversing with him, I instantly noticed as I would overhear them talking about some metal bands I coincidentally enjoyed. I'm not really sure how I wound up in this group, but maybe one of them made a move to hang out with me, possibly my hilarious gay friend Mac. This group consisted of Andy the Psycho, Krista, Mac, and two other girls apart from myself. We had our subgroups. Krista and the other two girls were heavily into anime, whilst Mac and I would get into deep conversations about mysteries of life. Andy, on the other hand, mostly sat and listened to Krista. He had an obvious fixation on her, and by the middle of the school year, everyone, including Krista, knew how desperate he was for her. Krista stated that she did not date, as her father was very protective, and to be honest, she kind of gave up a lesbian vibe anyway. Despite her efforts to pull away from him, Andy was practically on top of her, forcing hugs she awkwardly yanked away from and making it known he wanted her. On one occasion, she'd blocked his number after realizing it was a mistake to give it to him. He managed to steal her phone and unblock his number, and upon confrontation, he had admitted to blocking his twin brother's number in her phone. Andy absolutely hated his twin and never wanted to be compared to him, which would be expected as his brother was the charismatic one with lots of friends. Yet Andy said on multiple occasions he'd wished his brother dead and joked about the joyful thought of killing him. I didn't judge harshly at first, but my friend Mac did. He would let Andy know what a creep he was. One time, Krista and Andy were talking as he'd taken his seat right beside her. He was telling her not to talk to his brother, and somewhere in the conversation, right in the school library, he slapped her for not listening. I'll never forget the fear and anger on her face, and from then on, even after his awkward apology, Krista let him know he should stay away. Unfortunately, he'd taken to talking to me all along, as I've always been a soundboard whether I cared to be or not. Every day on the bus, it was Krista, Krista, Krista. Some days he'd just chant her name and get lost in his own thoughts of her. I would try to drop subtle hints that she's not interested, or at the very least to treat her normal and give her space. Apart from his desire for Krista, he was the most desperate guy I'd, I'd ever met. He would ask out every girl he met and spoke to for about a day. He would message me on Facebook about how he needed a girlfriend, and luckily I'd been in a relationship for four years by then, and he knew he couldn't have me. That still didn't stop him from hitting on me in such menial ways I didn't realize at first, including a near promposal. He'd once just typed my name, and when I asked him what was up, he simply said, you're beautiful, but you look exactly like someone from my past, and it makes me sad remembering her every time I look at you. I miss her. He definitely had a knack for making people uncomfortable, and some days I couldn't help but ignore him. Krista evaded him till high school graduation, but Andy's obsession only seemed to intensify. I genuinely thought he could be helped, and I could get through to him whilst keeping my own distance. But he set off too many alarms. Firstly, he was training for some entry into a military boot camp of sorts, and was discharged for reasons in relation to his mental state, though he wouldn't get too far into it. Secondly, every day he would write me at weird times early in the morning to tell me, Help! I can't stop thinking of her. I'm in love with her. This was clearly not true as he'd made moves on me and other girls in the time he'd known her. He made many implications that he would self-harm to get her off his mind, but nothing worked. He'd also somehow convinced himself that she wanted him and would frequent the grocery store she went to and say hi, though she just kept her head down and ignored him. One morning, as I was browsing social media, he messaged me the usual, I need her, I love her, help, I'm going crazy. I tried to help him analyze his feelings and come to his senses that he was fine and to let her be. 
I thought, if he's hitting on other girls but claiming to love her, let's see what he says to this. I typed out, tell me, what do you truly love about her? I cannot believe what he sent me next. It was the most ridiculous and degrading message I'd ever read about somebody. She has such small breasts. I love that about her. I dream of taking her virginity, and I don't think she'd mind how small I am, if you know what I mean. I felt like I'd read some psycho's personal diary. Truthfully, this girl was tiny, 18 years old and not even 100 pounds, which made me fear that he'd prey on her. He was very short, but she appeared vulnerable and smaller than him. I was on the last straw playing therapist for this guy who clearly had no goddamned idea he was scaring this girl. Up to the last time we spoke, the worst thing he'd requested of me was to get a hold of Krista's new number somehow for him in an attempt to lure her in to see him again. He grew frustrated with my decline and pleaded with me to help him obtain her address. Needless to say, the last night we spoke, I wished him well and told him I would not assist him in terrorizing Krista. Then I blocked him, and it's been about a year since then. I just hope he got the help he needed, and I hope for her sake he hasn't found out where she lives by now. It all started in high school. A few weeks in, I made a few friends and was keen on making more. So I tried to talk to everyone that I could. I was still somewhat new to the school, and one day I got lost, so I met the guy who would eventually become my stalker. He showed me around. We had a conversation, and at first I thought he would be nice to have as a friend. A week passed, and I had made a few friends at this point. I wanted to hang out with them as much as I could. I felt a little bad because my other friend was a bit of a loner. So I invited him to come hang out with us. He didn't talk much at first, but then he started talking more, mostly to me, asking advice on life. I was happy to help, until he started asking me to pat his head like a dog and make him wear a leash. A bit weird, might you say. I passed it off as a joke, and I humored him. Something I shouldn't have done as he started calling me master or mistress. I asked him not to do that. I told him that I wasn't comfortable with this behavior, but it was apparently too late to fix things. It happened day after day. He started skipping his classes to walk into and get kicked out of mine. He followed me all day, and if I had to go to the restroom, guess who followed me inside? I asked him to stop many, many times. He wouldn't, so I got the school involved. Well, I tried. They had no proof of stalking. I found that kind of strange since many teachers have kicked him out of my classes. But nevertheless, nothing happened. Except him getting more. Let's say protective. I asked one of my guy friends to help me out with some homework one night. My stalker overheard this from around the corner and didn't like who I asked for help. He fought every male I talked to. Some would find this flattering, but I found it annoying. I tried to tell him not to worry that we were just friends. But his exact wording was, they don't deserve you. They are worthless compared to my master. I tried to get him to stop. I yelled at him. I do feel bad because it was quite harsh, but it was the only way to get through to his thick head. I thought I was finally free from that cycle. He finally stopped following me until one day I found this letter in my locker. In this letter, my stalker expressed his disgust for males and his hate for himself that he must be evil for his master to treat him this way and that he must be punished. That I must be taught not to shun pets. It was a few pages long, and it was very disturbing. In fact, it was the most terrifying thing I've ever read, especially when I got done reading it and looked up and saw him staring at me from down the hall. He came up to me and opened his phone and started showing me pictures of, well, a cartoon character who had a similar appearance to me, with the same brown eyes and brown curly hair. Then he gave me a leash for him and asked me to walk him around. At that point, I ran away, up to the office, letter in hand. The principal, after five visits and finally had the fucking proof he needed, agreed to step in. The cops got involved, and soon after, a restraining order was put in place. He wasn't allowed within 50 feet of me. About a month later, I was sitting in my room doing some homework. When I heard a scratch at the window, I looked over and to my horror, he was standing just outside my bedroom window. He had a collar on his neck and a leash was dangling down from it. He was intensely glaring at me through the glass. His face then crooked into a disgusting grin before licking the surface of the window and ran off. 
Thankfully, I moved out of that town a month later. But after the nightmare I had last night, I decided to write all this down. Being stalked is not romantic or fun. It is terrifying, bone-shaking, nerve-wracking, and the worst thing I have ever gone through. I have no idea how he is now or what he is up to. I just hope he got those issues worked out. This story happened in October of 2004, back when I was still a three RD year high school student. My friends and I stuck around the school late at night after our annual Halloween party. We had agreed to try out my friend's Ouija board. It wasn't the brightest idea, but we needed a thrill. We found a nice spot under a huge narrow tree and proceeded with our half-assed ritual. There were five of us, two boys and three girls. We were all expecting some kind of paranormal contact. Rumors had it our school was haunted, but we've never really experienced anything firsthand. And it was Halloween when all the spirits came out to play. We all wanted to get spooked. Also, we've never seen a Huija board firsthand before, so we were pretty excited. Our school was an old Spanish colonial house, built in the 1800s when the Spaniards still occupied the Philippines. We were in a section of the school that doesn't get used often, located beside a creepy old Jesuit house, People only go there when they need to use the restroom, store equipment on one of the sheds, or make out with their boyfriends or girlfriends. We sat down in the middle of an open space with only an exposed bare bulb nearby, illuminating the surroundings. We were all having a laugh scaring each other with what-if scenarios. It was your typical dumb kid doing dumb things. My friend who brought the Ouija board proceeded to place it in the middle of our circle. If I remember correctly, it was the glow-in-the-dark version, which we found hilarious. But it gave us the ability to see what was written in the dark. Not knowing what to do and going after what we've seen in movies, we all proceeded to place our index finger on top of the planchette. We sat there looking at each other until one of us said, What's next? We didn't know if there was a proper way to start the ritual. Plus, the board didn't come with instructions, so we decided to just throw in a question. Is anyone there? I called out into the darkness. If there are spirits living here, please talk to us. One of the girls joined in. We clearly had no idea what we were doing. Still, nothing. Not even the slightest bit of wind. One of my friends jerked the planchette and the girl who brought the Ouija board screamed, breaking the silence. We all laughed at how ridiculous it was. After a bit of joking around, we decided to give it another go. We all placed our index fingers on the planchette once more and asked, If there's anyone there, we would like to make contact. Don't break the circle, Watsonkima, one of my friends jokingly said. Shut up, I whispered. We were just about ready to give up when the wind started to pick up. The stillness broke and the darkness around us seemed to move. Just a coincidence, we thought. Okay, don't break the circle, I yelled out. Is anyone there? I was excited. It was like a scene from a movie with dirt and dead leaves swirling around us. Guys, I'm scared, my friend sitting beside me said. My mom warned me about playing with forces we don't know. Did you die here? Were you killed during the war? Are you the headless priest that roams these halls? Do you know Jose Rizal, our national hero? Are you a hottie? My friend giggled. At this point, we were all throwing random stupid questions. Nothing. This is bullshit. I don't want to do this anymore, my friend said exasperated. We were all thinking the same. Just then a group of dogs from the neighboring house started barking at us through the chain link fence. These six dogs were growling and showing teeth. We all screamed and without finishing the ritual, bolted right out of there. We didn't see each other until after Halloween break. And this is where the story gets creepy. One of the girls told us about a weird experience she had the night after playing with the Ouija board. She had gotten home late after hanging out with her friends from the neighborhood when she realized she forgot the keys to her house. So she called her brother up, who was then still sharing a room with her, and what he said crept the hell out of her. He swore she was already home. He claimed to have seen her walk in a while ago and that she looked really tired and saw her head straight to bed. Creepy but no need to freak ourselves out, was all we thought. Besides, her brother must have just been tired and seeing things. But then my other friend started telling us about an encounter she had that Halloween night. 
She was going up to her room when the lights started flickering as she was ascending the staircase. Your typical horror movie visuals shrug it off to faulty wiring. But just then she saw the door to her room open and a dark figure stepped out and stood atop of their staircase. She couldn't make out the entity's face, but she recounted that she couldn't move and felt utter dread as the figure stared down at her. No way, my best friend, who just joined in the conversation, said in disbelief. Something happened to me as well. He recalled that he was sleeping one night when he woke up feeling really uncomfortable. He described his vision as having TV-like static, and a feeling of heaviness surrounded him. He looked around the room, and that's when he saw a bloody, charred face with piercing red eyes grinning at him through the window. I couldn't believe what I was hearing because I had an almost run-in with death that night. After the ritual, I was sleeping in our sedan on the way home after fooling around with the Ouija board when I felt our car jerk. I woke up instantly. Looking out the window, I found out that we'd been hit by a huge oil tanker. I panicked and leaped out of the car. Luckily, my mom and I survived the crash since the front of the car was a total wreck. I still don't have an explanation why those things happened to us, but thank God nothing happened after that. I never played or got near a Ouija board ever since. It starts on one cold October day. I was walking around. Even though I was wearing my parka, I felt a tiny bit cold. My dad was pulling some stuff from his truck. We hiked about three miles with my two brothers. Yosef, who was my older brother, and Miles, my younger, were with us. Joseph is about 17 and he's a senior in high school. Miles is about 12 and is still an annoying brat. We decided to camp out today because the house was being cleaned due to a funky smell coming from the bathroom. Dad said it would be done in about three days, so we decided to take that time to get out of school and camp out. Our dad, about 42 years old, is pretty cool. For a single father, he is pretty laid back. He doesn't care what we do as long as we get good grades and stay in school. He was different today, however, kind of like the time mom walked out on us. He barely spoke and spent a lot of time in his room. He would make frequent trips to the bathroom with buckets of what I thought was puke. Today, though, Joseph noticed too, but shrugged it off as just a mood swing of sorts. As we set up camp that night, we noticed we had no signal. We tried to tell dad, but he said we would be fine as he kept his shotgun with him. It was about three in the morning. A clicking noise came from his tent. We didn't know what it was, so we ignored it. Later on, our little brother couldn't quite fall asleep, so we decided that the three of us should go walking. We weren't scared of the woods or darkness, so we went deep into the trees until we reached the river. Stones to throw, fish to catch. It was perfect. We decided to go there. That's when we heard the gunshots. We stood there wondering what could have happened. We ran back to the tents, quietly scanning the area. Our dad sat back against his chair as he sobbed. We were just about to walk over to him when we noticed the blood coming from the tents. Wait, not blood, Kool-Aid. We watched as he cried. Within minutes, the entire fucking area was surrounded by the police. Someone else must have heard them. We looked in disbelief as they handcuffed him. We ran to him, and as he saw us, he cried harder. As they took him away, they searched the tents. As we looked as well, we saw two giant shotgun holes in the sides. Those were our tents. He tried to asterisk, kill asteriskus. The police eventually took us into custody and explained the entire thing. When my little brother was two, I was five, and my older brother seven, my mom tried getting custody of us. No one knows why, but she tried to get the fuck away from there. But what hit us the most was the fact that she didn't leave. She was there the entire time. She didn't leave us like Dad said. She was underneath the bathroom. It hit me. The dread in my father's eyes, the buckets of puke, the frequent visits to the bathroom. He killed her. He killed her and stuffed her in the bathroom for a whole fucking decade. The thought haunts me. It was a week after that he killed himself. He didn't even get a lawyer. He drowned himself in the toilet. We spent three days in custody. We were then sent to our Aunt Lenny, but she died about a month ago. Now we are being adopted by two parents. Nice, sweet people. Fairly young compared to Dad. There's one odd thing, however. They used to have children, and there's a funky smell in the bathroom.
Okay, so I've never written a submission for a subreddit before, but this is something I've wanted to get off my chest. And I decided I wanted to get someone to tell my story. So here it goes. I was about to go into third grade when I met him, so for the sake of my privacy, and so that I get no contact from this individual who is still free. Now to the story I was just starting third grade when I met him, David, along with his little gang of bullies. That's right, he was a fellow student. From day one, I was the target of his cruelty and his little rascal gang. Everything happened to me, from gum in my hair to being pushed on the playground. But he worst is what not even his little group knew about, the molestation. It all started when he followed me into the bathroom and turned off the lights. He started touching my hair and started throwing both insults and compliments, calling my hair so soft and beautiful to stupid kaleidoscope head. My hair was always changing colors when I was younger. It still does actually, so do my eyes. Then he started to do it all over. I wanted to scream, but he was bigger me, both in height and in size. Although I would later grow to be the tallest person in my class, which is one of the reasons it might have stopped, I think. Anyway, for the rest of the year, he continued the molestation like making touch him and his privates while we were in therapy. I almost forgot to mention that I was in therapy for my learning disability, which was realized after first grade. My teacher, what Miss O'Neill, was oblivious to the abuse along with my actual teacher. Miss Honeydale, bless those sweet teacher. Though I don't blame them, I actually had Miss Honeydale again in sixth grade as a teacher, but only after I transferred from another. But that's a story for another time. Again, sorry, I'm kind of getting off topic. But anyway, the abuse lasted almost until the end of third grade when David luckily moved schools for apparently different reasons that I'm not 100% sure about. Although recently I've been going online to see if I can find people from my old elementary, middle, and early high school years that I lost contact with. And unfortunately, his profile ended up crossing my path. His face is still the same, except he has a little facial hair. Everything else is still the same. Still has the same unemotional eyes, I remember. He is still the same old slightly chubby body with that same old stupid smile. I've never hated another person in my life more. David. He's the reason my boyfriends couldn't touch me or so anything to anything intimate. I only dated two in high school who were truly sweet people. But my fear of being touched and defiled again was just too great. I'd like to point out I'm 19 now and haven't had a boyfriend since my junior year of high school. Crying myself to sleep has been the only thing I could do. No matter how much I was called beautiful by my friends and family, nothing helped. I've contemplated suicide in the past when I was in middle school, mainly when my depression was really bad. But I'm happy to say now I've been able to pull myself together after I broke up with my last boyfriend in my junior year. I have been probably the happiest in a long time, and I'm continuing my path for happiness. I might even start a YouTube channel. It's something I've wanted to do for a long time, but I want to get a little bit more of my life together. So for the third grade groper, David, screw you asshole and let's not meet.